Today's talk is called the to-do or not to-do list. How many of you have a to-do list? Oh, we got a long to-do list. Stuff that we gotta do. Our life is filled with do-do. Gotta do this, gotta do that. Do, 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 more stuff to do. We're busy, busy, busy doing stuff. We're Westerners and we like to do stuff. We got a big list of things to do, do, do. Today I want to talk about some, maybe some releasing from that to-do list. Maybe there's some things we don't need to do that would give us a little bit more space. To do the things that we really want to do, which is to be about our business of awakening to who we are. We talked last week about God being like a refiner's fire. That, that you take that pure essence of what you are, but in its form, the way it comes, it needs to be melted down. All the impurities from your true self need to be melted down. So that which you truly are can then be revealed to you. The Christ, the Buddha nature, the awakened one, the Atman, the Brahman, many different words to describe that nature that is the true self in us. But we gotta be willing to put ourselves into the fire. Not be afraid to get a little heated up. Feel what it feels like to let go of everything unlike our true self. And we said last week, how do we know when the silversmith knows that the metal has been purified? We said that he's able, she is able to see her own reflection shining back, right back at you, right? That when that reflection of you, who you are now in your body, shines back at you, you're able to see that which you truly are. I want to talk more about that today. I want to talk more about that thing we look at in the mirror and how much time we spend wasting time, precious energy, with how we stare at this image and likeness, we only get a little bit of time to look at ourselves as the body that we are. You get that? It's, it's short here. I just, Maureen and I just watched last night um, two and a half hour memorial service to Sky St. John, a beloved minister in Hawaii who died. It was the service that was the public service for him. And, and, and in it, I got to see this great man, this incredible man, the very short life that he lived and the huge difference that he made in people's lives. I also got to look at where was I when I was with him two years ago. And I was with him at the conference at Canuga. And I wished I'd spent more time with him. Anybody ever have this feeling? I wished, if I'd only known what was going to happen, I wished I would have spent more time with that person. I didn't know I only had a few moments left to be with that person. In fact, that was the last time I'd get to see him. And I made other things more important and didn't spend that time with him. You know, we all have that kind of regret because our life here is very, 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 very short. I was reading about these uh, two 21-year-olds. One was talking about her relationship with a girlfriend. And when you're 21 years old, it's all about your body image. You want your body to look a certain way. It's very important to you that your body looks good. And one of them was talking to her other friend and saying, I am not going to the New Year's Eve party until I lose 10 pounds. I'm not going. I'm going to lose. Them. That's my to-do list. I will lose 10 pounds. Anybody relate to that before I go? So for three months, she locked herself in her house, didn't go to see anybody to lose the 10 pounds. And when they were together toasting for New Year's Eve, she lost the 10 pounds. And she said to her friend, finally, I can check that one off. She picked up a drink to have a toast and said, now I'm really going to start living my life. Yeah. And two days later, she died in an auto accident. How quickly life changes. How important something can seem in one moment, and then how unimportant it is in another moment. We never know. We have such a small amount of time here. We don't want to waste it doing things that aren't ours to do. Today's talk comes from an article by Martha Beck. And I got it from Evelyn, gave it to me and said, I think this will preach. And I said, you're right, it will. And in it, she talks about five things for which it really is too late. <laughs> we live in a culture here that says, it's never too late. I can do everything. I've got my bucket list. You got your bucket list? I'm going to cram all this stuff in my bucket list. I'm going to get them all done. These things are really important. And in our culture, we're addicted to the idea it's never too late. Well, here's five things for which it is too late. The first one is it's too late to get a completely different body. <laughs> Say amen. 
You can tug it, you can nip it, you can snip it, you can pull it up, you can get your face done, you can get your eyes done, you can get your little tushy done, you can get big calves, you can get big pecs. It's too late. It's over. You can only do so much with the body. This is the body that you get. I'm not saying don't take care of it. I'm not saying don't work out. I'm not saying lose or gain. But don't be obsessed with it. And how do I know about this? I have a master's degree in self-image and body obsession. I am a gym rat. I love going to the gym. And I just, I just love to go to the gym, period. And I love how it looks as well, too. But that's changing. And I, I look at these beautiful bodied 18 to 30 year olds. They're beautiful. I watch them looking at themselves in the mirror and I want to shake them up and down and go, this is it, you'll never look better, you'll never look better, this is it, you are beautiful, this is it, stop it, you're beautiful. And I look at them looking in the mirror and they're like, it's not good enough, it isn't big enough, my tush, I gotta get it bigger, I gotta get it tighter. I go, baby, sweetheart, darling, you'll never look better than you do now. But they don't know, because the wisdom isn't there to know at that point, right? That comes later. And with having had this injury, I've had to really tone down my body image of what I think I should look like to look good. Giving up the obsession with the body being perfect allows you to establish a different relationship with your body. So when you take that one out, it's too late to get a different body. Take it out of the bucket, a little bit more room in the bucket is there for you. How about put this in the bucket list? That you're willing today, when you go home, take your clothes off in the bathroom with the door closed. If you're willing to stare at yourself in the mirror and finally say to yourself, I accept my body exactly as it is. I love my body and I'm grateful for it. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because we're so judgmental about our bodies. We want them to be different. We struggle, the mind struggles with its own image. I'm tired of fighting myself. I'm tired of trying to make it look a certain way so I can finally be good enough when the truth is I am good enough. The body is an amazing mechanism. Trillions of cells die and trillions are reborn. I don't have to even think about it. It's a gift just to be alive. Practice this mindfulness of gratitude towards your body, accepting the body. It's like a relaxation response. Finally, the mind goes, oh, you're going to stop fighting this. Great. Oh, now there's some more moving space and breathing space for something else. That's the first one. The second one in says, it's too late to live a life without purpose. Now, when I talk about purpose, we're going to do Mary Morrissey's 10-week program, which will have a lot of specific things for exercising our minds. But our real purpose for being here is not to do or not to do, but to be who we are and wake up to who we are. That's what we're here for. So how I define purpose is like this. Living your life's purpose happens when you begin choosing the state of mind that feels most fundamentally correct to you in each moment. Say amen. 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 Choosing the state of mind which feels most fundamentally correct for you in each moment. That is living your purpose. That's living on purpose. And then everything becomes a reflection of that. You know the old Zen saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> so you know, that's what this is. It's chop wood, carry water. It's back to what you do every single day. When you live your life with intention and purpose to use everything to awaken, well, then everything becomes part of that. We had to clean, I had to clean the bathrooms. I, I do bathrooms, Maureen does laundry. You know, you have split up things you do. I, I do the bathrooms. And usually I do the bathrooms when people are coming over. And someone was supposed to visit last week and it didn't come, so it's like, I don't have to do it. But it's been about two weeks. <laughs> you know, it's time now to clean the bathroom up. You know, which is not my favorite thing you do, but it's chop wood and carry water. Living my life on purpose means that I have to infuse everything with it. So I go and I put in Michael Jackson on the stereo. I, I'm going to make a change for once in my life. Wow! I'm going to feel real good. Make a difference. I go into the toilet bowl and I'm down there. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. I'm cleaning out this dirty toilet bowl. Yeah. Nothing could have been any clearer. You know what I'm saying? No, the man in the mirror. My favorite thing to look at. Then the bathroom happens easy. It becomes part of living your life on purpose. 
Do, do, do you just get lost in the, in the fragrance of the garden? Or do you get obsessed about the lawnmower that's broken? Yeah, there's always one more thing to do. And if you're always looking at, well, I got that done, now I've got to get this done. And I've got this done, but now I've got to get that done. You're never done! All the fun is sucked out of life. And you got you chop wood, you carry water. Period. So I didn't mulch the garden this year yet. Oh, but I can look at the twigs that are around the tree in the front yard, and Maury and I can spend an hour cleaning it out, and we can be grateful that we at least got that done. It changes your focus when you live your life on purpose with intention. And then everything becomes part of your practice. So we get rid of that one. That one that says, I always have to have something else to keep doing, and I never enjoy what I'm doing right now. Living on purpose says, enough already with that one. The third one says, it's too late to live on ego candy. And I live on ego candy. You're, you're a performer. Performers, the sugar rush of being loved by everybody. Yeah, baby. They stood up and they, I gave me, oh, goody, 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 goody. Two o'clock, it's like, did I miss that one note that I was singing? Or, I forgot that great example in my talk, and oh, how could I have forgotten that? That was, you see what I'm saying? Ego rush. Ego rush is a sugar high. Comes and it goes. They love you and they, then they don't love you. In my business, I get to really look at that a lot. I remember when I was really young on the path, and this is like 1982, and, and at that point, when I spoke, when I was a speaker, I could actually see my notes. I had good vision, so I spoke with notes. People say, why are you note-free now? Because I can't see my notes. That's why I became note-free, because I had to. I remember when it first started happening, where it went, I can see my notes over here. I can see my notes over here. I can't see anything over there at all. You know, that becomes what happens to you as you get older. So I became note-free, not by choice. I had to, I had no choice but to do that. So I'm giving my talk, and that time I had notes. And I was maybe six months into my first ministry in Port Angeles, Washington. There's this little tiny, tiny house that we were in, a little ranch house, maybe 30 people in the room. And I'm giving my talk, and I'm kind of nervous. And someone in, in the, oh, right about where, where you are, Peter, they get up while I'm talking. I'm in the middle of giving my talk. It's like six, eight minutes. I'm not even going to roll yet. That's what I'm talking about. And he just gets up out of his seat and he walks down the center aisle like this. <laughs> he goes over to the prayer box, which I was standing in front of because we had our prayer box there. He takes the brochure and goes. He looks at me and goes. <laughs> He walks over to the sliding door in between where I'm talking in the living room and the kitchen. And he opens it up, and he goes like this, bam, like that. And I went, whoa, talk about oneness. The whole group was like, what was that chemosan? That was someone who obviously didn't like what I was feeding him that day. And you know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. He actually, he had the audacity to come back to our potluck and eat like a pig. <laughs> Act like nothing was wrong. He just ruined everything for me. What did nothing's wrong? What's the matter with you? You're crazy. People are funny. They do and they don't. They see it and they don't see it. I'm in line, just last week as an example. Someone came in line and said, oh, that example about the state of your bed is the state of your head. That makes no sense to me at all. I don't believe it. I don't make my bed. I'm not going to. And I went, OK. <laughs> Next person, next person says, oh, that example, that the state of your mind is like the state of your bed in your head. Oh my God, that made such sense to me. I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life. That was wonderful. And I went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting with one of the most popular speakers in the New Thought Movement who gets $10,000 for talking for 10 minutes. I'm about to introduce her to 500 people. And I'm sitting with her, and, and I'm just holding her hand. And I hadn't seen her in a while, so I stood up while everybody's getting ready on stage. I, I whispered in her ear, and I said, um, I know you've been traveling a lot. I said, you, you look really tired. And she dropped my hand, grabbed her purse, and said, what are you talking about? I, what, my, my microphone. 
<laughs> Actually, that, that is what happened to her. She knocked her microphone off. She's all ready to go. She's going, I, look, I don't look good. What do you mean I don't look good? Don't I look okay? And I, I went, oh, that was so the wrong thing to say to her. That was not helping set her up for a good experience with the group. And so I, I leaned over and I whispered in her ear. I said to her, you look marvelous. <laughs> you are so beautiful. There's never a moment when you don't look beautiful. And I said, and do you know, with every ounce and fiber of my being, I wished I were you. <laughs> we all are so fragile. There should be a big sign in our chest that says, please be gentle. I'm very fragile. I'm not sure of who I am. And no matter how much success you may have in the app, no matter how many people buy your CDs or listen to you on live stream or give you everything you want, we're all like little children running around being afraid, right? It's too late to live on ego candy. We can let that go and be nourished by something much deeper. Yes? Yes? The bucket's getting empty now so it can be filled. Here's another one, number four. It's too late to turn toxic people into healthy ones. It's too late for that. Amen. Amen. My, my, my dad was a practicing alcoholic, a mean alcoholic, for 50 years. And when he finally got sober, we thought we'd be getting dad back. Uh, uh, finally get a dad. We didn't know what dad back meant. We never had one. And we thought we'd finally get one. The truth was, he was worse as a mean, dry drunk than he was when he was drunk. He wasn't interested in changing Alvin Harrison Levy at all. It was a waste of energy trying to change him. It's a waste of energy for you to spend one more moment with people who drag you down and make you feel little and small and less than what you truly are. Don't waste any more time with them. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It just means you stop giving them all this energy and attention because they're never going to give you back the love you want from them. They can't do it. They don't know how to deliver it to you. They just can't. And so you've got to release them and say, I love you, I bless you, I'm not wasting any more time with this. Because there are other people who are waiting to love you. They're waiting to give you the time and the energy that you need. Don't waste any more time with those things that don't. Take it out of your bucket list. I'm not going to try to change people who cannot be changed. I'm going to work on changing the one thing I can work with, and that's my relationship with myself. Amen. Amen. It's too late. This is my favorite. It's too late to feel guilty about enjoying simple things. It's too late. I love to nap. I am, a, I am a nap master. I like an hour to an hour and a half every day. I love to nap. Maury and I both go, you know what? It's our favorite time of time. It's nap time. <laughs> we go over, we shut the phones off, we lie down, we put a little blanket on, go, oh, I can't wait for drool to start coming out of my mouth. And it's not it's nap time. An hour and a half. Yeah, baby. New day starts over. I love to nap. Maureen likes to feed the squirrels in the back. Oh, actually, the birds. The squirrels are there, they get fed too. But she loves to do that. She loves to go out there in the morning and, and give them their food. She loves to break up the ice in the pond. She loves doing that. Do it more. She loves Sudoku. Loves just to play Sudoku. It's good. It's good stuff. We all think we're so busy doing so many important things, and then when we get them done, finally, then we're going to do those simple things we really enjoy. I say, you've got it backwards. Enjoy the simple things now. Bring yourself into everything you enjoy doing, and intensify your enjoyment of that. That's what you're here for. When you get your diagnosis, and you will, that you're terminal, and you've only got a few more minutes left, what's going to matter most? I want a few more days to do the simple things I always love to do, that I've been waiting my whole life to do, and now I can, because I have permission. I'm giving you permission this morning. Thank you. Do those simple <laughs> things you love to do. And stop being another addicted, crazy Westerner who always thinks I have to be accomplishing something, otherwise there's something wrong with me. I have to do more, do more, do more, get it done. And boy, then I'm going on vacation. It takes like 10 days to stop going like this. I gotta do something. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is be who you are. It's already here. I was talking to some guy in the, in the steam room and he was saying he just got back from being in Europe for about three months, Holland in particular. And he said, what I loved about being there was people there love to be on holiday. 
They loved to take time off. They loved just to be with their family. They loved to go on picnics and hike. I felt so relaxed with them. I felt like a part of their mind was just, hello. And they had plenty of time for me as a stranger and a foreigner. They were just there. They, they had plenty of time. And I came back to the States and I noticed the difference between a culture that is okay relaxing and being present, enjoying simple things, to a culture that always feels like, I've only got a couple seconds with you and I've got to get this over with. <laughs> because someone is texting me <laughs> and who they are is much more important than you. <laughs> it's madness. And no one's doing it to us. We are doing it to ourselves. We can make a different choice. So again, remember, it's too late to feel guilty about enjoying simple things. A prescription for today, spend an hour doing something you simply enjoy. And don't be feeling guilty about it, okay? What for? You enjoy it? Do it. It's okay. Okay, let's go to a lesson summation. I'll stop screaming at you and we'll see if we remember anything. What's maybe? What is that thing that you came up with living in life? Oh, I'll get to that at the end. My wife is correcting me right in the middle of the talk while I'm on film. 1,500 people listening to me. Actually, 38 every week, but I pretend it's 3,800. It doesn't matter. Whatever I have to tell myself to feel good, it doesn't matter. It's a couple of zeros, right? What difference does it make? So anyway. It's too late. It's too late to get a completely different body. Give it up! It's not gonna happen. You're not gonna get a different body. You can work with the one you have, but please learn to love and appreciate it. I'm working with this one a lot. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. As I get older, he's changing. <laughs> oh well. It's too late to live a life without purpose. And what's purpose? Purposeful is living your life's purpose. It happens when you begin choosing the state of mind that feels most fundamentally correct to you in each moment. That's what it means. Three, it's too late to live on ego candy. It's too late to spend another minute starving your soul to feed the need for praise and approval from other people. Because sometimes they'll give it to you and sometimes they won't. This is Zen's statement that goes, pleasure, pain, loss, and gain. It's really all the same. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> four, it's too late to turn toxic people into healthy ones. It's too late to spend more time with people who leave you feeling crushed and disappointed over and over again. Instead, spend time with people who really are waiting to love you. And finally, it's too late to feel guilty about enjoying simple things. Purge your bucket list to create space for the little things that make you happy. That's the most important thing you can do. Last night, I was, as I was going to bed after having spent two and a half hours listening to the amazing accomplishments of Sky St. John, the thing he did most for me is he loved every second of life. He loved it. You met him. Did you meet him? Have you ever met Sky? He was a guy that loved to be alive every moment. And I went, that was his gift to me. And when I woke up this morning, I had this affirmation in my mind. I want to share it with you. It didn't make it to the, the bulletin cover. It says, I'm loving the life that I'm living, and I'm living the life that I love. I'm loving the life that I'm living, and I'm living the life that I love. Say that with me. I'm loving the life I'm living. I am living the life I love. Enough already. This is my life. No more to-do lists. I want to be who I truly am. And then when my doingness becomes infused with beingness, there's a moment of heaven on earth. And you become much more enjoyable to be around. Not just for yourself, but for all your brothers and sisters and family members, co-workers, and everybody you know on planet Earth. Practice well and deeply. It isn't just for you, but for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Namaste. Namaste.